DNA is called deoxyribonucleic acid. Ribo refers to ribose sugar which has five carbon atoms. and there are hydroxyl groups on these two carbons. <clears throat> it's possible to number the carbon atoms in this ribose sugar starting uh, from the oxygen atom and going clockwise. So we have one, two, three, four, and five. Now let's see what the term deoxy mean. Deoxy means that this is a deoxyribose sugar where this two prime hydroxyl is not there. So deoxy uh, ribose signifies um, the absence of the hydroxyl group on the second carbon. Then we have the nitrogenous space. And to the fifth carbon is attached a phosphate group. And this phosphate group is negatively charged. And here we have the basic repeating unit of DNA, which is a deoxyribose um, with a nitrogenous base and a monophosphate, a single phosphate. Now, there are four nitrogenous bases that are possible. Purines have this double ring structure with nitrogens at the first, third, seventh, and the ninth positions. And um, there are two purines, adenine and guanine. Pyrimidines have a six-atom um, six uh, ring with nitrogens replacing carbon at the first and the third positions and then there are two pyrimidines cytosine and thymine. Before we discuss the structure of uh, DNA further let us define what hydrogen bonds are and this is best done with the example of the uh, water molecule which has an oxygen atom covalently bonded to two hydrogen atoms. Now oxygen has an um, uh, atomic mass of eight and therefore there are eight protons in its nucleus and therefore you have eight positive charges over here. Hydrogen has one proton and therefore there's one positive charge at the protons of the hydrogen atoms. Now, the electrons that are shared between the oxygen and the hydrogen, they are floating around somewhere between the oxygen and the hydrogen atoms. However, given the fact that the oxygen nucleus has eight positive charges, the electrons will tend to be closer to the oxygen proton or the oxygen nucleus than the hydrogen nuclei because of the electro the stronger electrostatic attraction provided by the eight positive charges at the oxygen nucleus. As a result, the oxygen end of this molecule has 
a slight positive, uh, slight negative charge, whereas the hydrogen atoms will end up with a slight positive charge. And therefore, um, this molecule, which is neutral since it has um, 10 positive charges and 10 negative charges, 10 electrons, overall it's neutral, has, due to the stronger attraction of the electrons by the oxygen nucleus, a slight negative charge at the oxygen nucleus and slight positive charges at the hydrogen nuclei, and that makes this a polar molecule. And now, let's say we have another um, water molecule like this. And this oxygen will also have a slight negative charge and these hydrogens will also have a slight positive charge. There will be an electrostatic attraction between the oxygen um, uh, atoms of one mo uh, water molecule with the hydrogen atoms of uh, another water molecule because they're polar molecules with slight negative and slight positive charges and this electrostatic attraction is in fact what's known as a hydrogen bond. Now unlike covalent bonds that involve electron sharing, hydrogen bonds are not as strong um, and are uh, easier to, to break apart than covalent bonds since the hydrogen bonds are just weak in electrostatic attraction caused between polar molecules. Next, let us discuss the discovery of the structure of DNA. One piece of information um, that went into uncovering the structure of uh, DNA was called Chagraff's Rules. And um, what um, Chagraff did was uh, to measure the amount of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine in the DNA of many different organisms, all the way from E. coli bacteria to several different tissues in humans. And the first observation that Chagraff made was that the total amount of purines is equal to the total amount of pyrimidine. So let's take the example of Diplococcus over here. And the total amount of adenine we have is about 30 moles. And the total amount of guanine we have is 50 moles. And uh, the, the, uh, the total amount of purines therefore is about 50 moles whereas the total amount of thymine is 32 moles and the total amount of cytosine is 18 moles. And once again, when we add up the number of moles of thymine and the number of moles of cytosine to get the total amount of pyrimidines, we get 50 moles, which is equal to the amount or the number of moles of purines. And so therefore, the first rule is that total purines is equal to the total amount of pyrimidines. Let's try this out with a different um, uh, organism. Let's say with myobacterium tuberculosis that causes uh, tuberculosis and the total amount of pyrimidines I have is about 15 plus 35 or 50 moles. And the total amount of purines I have is 15 plus about 35. And that adds up again to 50 moles. So the total amount of purines um, is uh, the same as the total amount of pyrimidines. And note here that in fact, the abundance of the um, relative abundance of the 
adenines and, and guanines are flipped over here because in uh, Diplococcus, there were more adenines and less guanines, whereas in Myobacterium, there's fewer guanine and more um, adenines. Nevertheless, if you add up the total amount of purines and you add up the total amount of pyrimidines, they are exactly the same. And you can go and verify this for all the other species in this table and it will turn out to be a general rule that's true. Next, the, the kind of the next observation that um, Chagraf made was that the amount of adenine is always roughly equal to the amount of thymine. So A is equal to T. And once again, you can browse this table and verify that this is more most generally the case. And similarly, the total amount of C is equal to the total amount of G. So you can see here we have 18, 17 about the same, 18 about 18 and so on. And therefore the total amount of or the moles of cytosine is equal to the total number of moles of guanine in the DNA of organisms as varied as bacteria and humans. Note that the amount of um, A plus T is not the same as the amount of G plus C. And this ratio can vary wildly from 0 0.42 in myobacterium and that means my bacterium has a lot more uh, 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 guanine and cytosine and um, to 1.85 for sea urchins, which means sea urchins have a lot more ad adenine and thymine than guanine and cytosine. Note, however, that the amount A plus T to G plus C ratio is basically the same in different um, uh, tissues, thymus, liver, and sperm from the same species, humans. And that's because um, all the tissues arise from the same single cell zygote and therefore have basically the same genome um, in their cells. And also because different um, individuals of the same species have very, very similar genomes to each other. And therefore, the A plus T to G plus C ratio does not vary between tissues of the same species. Next, let's discuss how Watson and Crick deduced the base pairing rules using their X-ray crystallography experiments as well as Chagraff's rules. Now, in X-ray crystallography, uh, a substance whose um, um, atomic or molecular structure we wish to determine is crystallized, and then you illuminate this crystal with X-rays. The X-rays are uh, diffracted um, by this, this crystal and they create a characteristic diffraction pattern, uh, a pattern of light and dark spots because of uh, the, the, the uh, light waves, the X-ray waves adding up or canceling each other out. And from this pattern, one can infer the structure of the molecule because each geometric um, arrangement of the molecule will produce its own characteristic diffraction pattern. Now, based on this, the diffraction pattern of um, crystallized DNA, Watson and Crick had figured out that 
the um, the DNA was a double helix or a spiral staircase of constant width or constant thickness. Now, Watson and Crick realized that if a pyrimidine paired with a pyrimidine or a purine paired with a purine, that would cause the, the, the thickness of DNA to vary like this. And since the X-ray diffraction data, X-ray crystallography data suggested that in fact, the thickness was constant like this, they realized that the only way um, um, you could get a constant thickness was if a, a pyrimidine paired with a purine, um, always. And so we can say that a purine, which is either A or G, it base pairs with a pyrimidine, which is C or T. Now, the question arises, does A pair with T or A pair with C? Similarly, does G pair with C or G pair with T. And this is where Chagraff's rules come in because Chagraff had determined that you always have the same amount of A and T and that implies that A must be pairing with T and not with C. Similarly, you always had the same amount of guanine as cytosine and that implied that C and G pair, not T and G. And thus, the combination of the uh, X-ray crystallography data and Chagraff's rules allowed Watson and Crick to propose a double helical structure of DNA. And in, in this structure, there are two strands. So this would be one strand and this would be another strand. Now, on the outside of the molecule, so over here, and over here is the sugar phosphate backbone. And the sugar is, of course, ribose. And the nucleobases or the nitrogenous bases, they go on in the inside. In the backbone, one nucleotide is joined to another nucleotide through a phosphate group. And in this phosphate group, there are two bonds where the three prime carbon of one nucleotide is connected to the phosphate through an oxygen and the five prime carbon of the next nucleotide is connected to the phosphate through another oxygen and such bonds are called ester bonds
since there are two ester bonds and a phosphate group that connect one nucleotide to another the bond that holds the backbone together is called a phospho diester bond and this uh, uh, phospho diester bond is obviously it's a covalent bond that involves uh, sharing of electrons and so it's a strong covalent bond the question then arises that what holds the strands together so what is the nature of these bonds indicated in the dotted lines that hold the two strands together and they are in fact hydrogen bonds that are weak electrostatic attractions between the polar nitrogenous bases and the 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 way that these hydrogen bonds are made there's three between um, uh, cytos uh, cytosine and a guanine and two between an adenine, um, adenine and thymine in fact dictate what uh, a, a nitrogenous base pairs with uh, what other nitrogenous base a cannot pair with g simply because um, the hydrogen bonds or the, the, the geometrical layout or the polarity of the molecule is not compatible with guanine. One final thing to point out, I'll just clear up some space here, is let's look at the um, sequence or the orientation of the ribose sugar on this strand of the DNA. So the the way the ribose sugar is, is oriented is that we have one carbon, um, one prime here, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. So here's the five prime carbon, three prime carbon, and then this three prime carbon makes a phosphodiester bond with the five prime carbon of the next nucleotide and there's a three prime carbon of the next nucleotide and then you get the five prime of the one over and then three prime, five prime, three prime and so on and therefore in this strand, five prime carbons are at the top and the three prime carbons are at the bottom. In the other strand, because of the way um, the um, base pairing works and the way the hydrogen bonds are made, the ribose is oriented in an opposite manner. So there's the first carbon, second, third, fourth, and then fifth. And this five prime uh, carbon is connected through the phosphate to the three prime carbon on the next nucleotide, which is connected. Uh, and then you have the five prime, which is then connected to the three prime carbon through a phosphodiester bond and then five prime, three prime, five prime, and so on. And that implies that the other strand has five primes at the bottom and three primes at the top. So the two strands have a direction, uh, a polarity and orientation, and this orientation uh, these, this orientation is opposite for the two strands and so we say that the two strands 
are anti parallel and there are important consequences uh, of this uh, um, this property that the two strands are anti parallel when we start to discuss the synthesis of DNA or DNA replication.